guys, get your tissues ready because it's a bit of an emotional story, I feel like. I'm having what I believe to be an existential crisis with this game, specifically around when to soak and when to engage. My thinking is in pre-10 world, you need to soak hard, but post-10, you should go for risks. Invasions on boss, for instance, because net kills are worth more XP then. But my team are usually in a soak mode until we die, while the other team continues dominating the map. Do you have any advice here? Well, sometimes one team will be more skilled than another, as rotations, drafting, and so on. There are also asymmetric advantages that teams can have. It is important to recognize when your team has better wave clear and when the enemy team has better wave clear. When your team has a better level 1 or when your team has a better level 20 or vice versa. It's important to see who has more stuns, who has an easier team to run, what is the goal of your team. I would recommend you to look at your 10 previous drafts and say which of the 5 win conditions your draft fulfilled and then check if you and your team played like it. That is far more useful than second guessing whether you should soak or not. Soaking is a very general statistical evaluation. Hero kill is worth so much, a minion wave is worth so much, but you cannot make all your decisions based on that. If I run a team with no wave clear at all, it's not about whether I'll soak until level 13 or 10 or seven or three, it's about how am I going to win? What is the purpose of my draft? I want you to go into your replays and you actually do that for your last 10 drafts. Answer these questions. Who's better at wave clear? Who has more stunts? Who is better at team fights? Uh, who has better early game? And who has better late game? Answer these five questions or so. And then if you want more advanced questions, it's who has better mobility? Who has better protection? Who has better globals? Uh, who has better engage and who has better disengage? If you follow these 10 questions and you can, you can check the VOD on this and ri actually write them down. Cause you're saying you have a crisis. I want to help you, but you gotta listen to me. F write down these 10 questions and answer them on all of your last 10 replays. I'm gonna do one example for you. For instance, Kerrigan has good wave clear if she takes the right talent. She has auto attack and she has two a two one auto attack on AoE. She has two AoE spells. Tychus, two AoE spells. Malfurion is so-so, but among supports, he's mediocre. Kerrigan and Tychus have high wave clear. Tychus can do it safer because he does it from range. Kerrigan does it from melee. That makes Tychus less gankable. Okay, so so far we're we're A level, A uh, US grading system. A, A, whereas my safety is A and Kerrigan's is C. Malfurion among healers is a B or a C. Ariel is top, um, Brightwing is top. Malfurion is middling. When he takes Treant, he's a little better. But he does it safely from range, unlike Karazim, who's melee. Diva is A+, and she does it safely because she has escape. Anubarak among tanks is above average. Among normal heroes, he's below, but among tanks, above average. So I would rate our wave clear good. Theirs. Genji is average or below average as an assassin. That makes him fairly low, actually. Uh, assassins have the highest wave clear. His is low, very low for assassins. Makes him average in general. Brightwing, good for healers. Chromie, quite average, but very safe. Urel, great. As offlaners go, one of the best. She can double lane. Muradin, terrible. So I would say we have slightly better wave clear. So we can play a macro game based on wave clear. Taking more camps, killing their camps more quickly, and dealing, killing the wave clears uh, more quickly. Now we count uh, safety of clear. I'm from afar, she's melee. She can escape. She's from afar, but no escape. Greetings, he has a lot of escape, and he's, but he's melee. So overall, our escape ability is quite good. We can safely park Diva or Anubarak in deeply exposed lanes. Okay, but we cannot safely park any of these three in deeply exposed lanes. Sky Temple and Towers of Doom have deeply exposed lanes because Sky, the forts go away very quickly because of the objective. Now, who can they put in deeply exposed lanes? Brightwing, because of Blink Heal to another minion wave. Or Zed. Uh, Genji can swift strike away. 
Chromie cannot. Unless she doesn't sandblast and she uses here and there level 11 talent to port to one of her ghosts at the keep. Yurel is very safe. She has a jump and she's very survivable. Merlin is very safe. So they can actually park four players deep in a lane. That's a benefit, but they won't clear very quickly. All of these things play into whether teams will rotate or whether they won't rotate. Whether you will uh, be safe or not. Whether you're pr prepared for certain situations in the game. Now we're going to count stunts. I have a displacement. Kerrigan has a pull and a stun. Root. Some slows. Mass stunts and slows. Okay, we're very good on the CC. That means we have quite a good level 1 team fight. How is our late game power spike? Our level 10 or 20? Ultralisk, Odin, Trank or Twilight. We're gonna get micro missiles and Cocoon. Cocoon and Ultra offer even more CC. That makes us very scary at the level 10. Okay, uh, then look at them. Blink heal is quite average. It makes her safer, but not explosive team fight. Genji gets X Strike or Dragon Blade. Pretty good, but it's not CC, so it needs other things to set it up. Chromie gets slowing sounds, which is good, but not on a fast moving map like Sky Temple. It's not so easy to get use out of it there because it's very wide open. Yorel only gets survivability. Same as Brightwing makes her safer, but it's not an engaged tool. And Merlin gets Avatar, makes him safer, but it's not an engaged tool. So when you look at what we have, actually, we are the engager. We have a lot of control over the fight at level 10. We love to get to level 10 without a disadvantage. But they can resist our initial engage. So they are the defender team. They're going to survive with X-Strike to dodge our abilities. They're going to survive with Blink Heal. They're going to survive with Slowing Sands, with, with Absorbent Defender and with Avatar then they can win the counterattack. Now, this is important to understand because we are the ones that win a team fight at level 10 in five seconds. And they are the ones that survive the first 10 seconds and then win the counterattack. They have to play like they understand that. If they go in bursty, Murden never back off until he die, they're playing it wrong because they got loads of healing and sustain way more than us, right? So it's not about it's not about whether we should soak or not. We're not thinking about that. We're thinking who has better what. And based on that, you make your decisions together with the with the um, you make your decisions together with your general understanding of the hero XP versus the minion XP. Now I'm going to give you uh, there's more to be said about this draft and about many others, but I hope that you kind of get what I'm saying. Now, if you are asking yourself, and you are, when should I soak? When should I rotate? It's about understanding all these. So if I see we have the better team fight, we have more stuns, and we have better level 10s that offer us more initiative, but they have better wave clear, there's this clear imbalance in our asymmetrical advantages. That means if we play passively, we will lose. But if we play actively, aggressively, and sometimes illogically, we may win. Understanding that influences our decisions, allows us to do things that normally might be wrong. So let's say the, the levels on the map were both level seven, right? Our team is seven, they're seven. The lanes are balanced. All the lanes meet in the middle. There are no mercenary camp advantages for either team. And you are the solo laner and you are Yorel and you feel like your team is passive and the enemy is passive but you see that they have better wave clear and so on it's fine as Yorel to clear a lane quickly quickly in the solo lane mount up rotate to mid you are now five man together that means that there is a pressure for your team to make something happen quickly because you're together to just extrapolate if you stay together forever as five in mid eventually you lose your top and your bottom gets pushed in you lose xp you lose forts gg catapults so the longer period you are together with five and in fact every second counts that's true for second one uh the more you need to make something happen so if the solo laner joins the rest of the team you must team fight and there is a clock on that. There's a times. There's a quick. There's a sand of time running out. So I like to s equate amounts of seconds to the amount of time.
that the solo laner is allowed to clear their lane and rotate to the team. There is a time. At level 7 I would say you can rotate, come mid, stay for no more than 10 seconds. If you can get a kill in 5 that's great, then you need to start preparing to leave. If you didn't get a kill in 5 to 10 seconds, you must go back up. And that kind of coincides with the next minion wave arriving for Urel, for you, for in the solo lane. And you're gonna soak that. That's true at level 7. Stay any longer and you're gonna miss a whole wave. And even if you get a kill, it will be nullified by the wave you lost. You accurately described this. At level 10, you have a little bit more leeway, a bit more time. Let's say that at level 10 you've got 20 to 30 seconds. And after that you need to go back. You're allowed to miss one or two minion waves top. Because you're staying mid. Assuming the enemy team does not stay uh, come mid. But they stay top. You have a 5 versus 4 for 20-30 seconds. It has good odds to get a kill. And that kill is going to give you other advantages. Than losing the minion wave hurts you. But then, you don't stay forever. After you get the kill, you go back top, you deep push, you protect forts, you get some XP, and you repeat. At level 13, you come again. And at level 12, you come again. Now, when you are level 13 versus 11, you have as much reason to group up as the 11 team has against the 13. And here's why. The logic is very simple. A level 13 team against 11 can lose a 4 versus 5. They have talent lead, but now they're down a person. A level 13 team that is together as 5 cannot lose a team fight statistically against a level 11. So when you're 13 and you group up as a whole team to push somewhere, that's called making use of your talent advantage. You are unstoppable, but you must make something happen. Now, when you are 11 versus 13, you cannot win a 5 on 5. So the only way to win it is to be 5 versus 4 with 11 versus 13. So it is good to leave the solo lane, join your 11 team, and to actually fight the talent down, because that might be the way back in the game. The 13 team is playing greedy by keeping their solo lane solo with 11 versus 13. Now, if you're 11 and you group up as 5, but the 13 team follows suit and it's a 5-on-5, five five, what do you do as 11 team? You don't fight, because now you're neutrally down a level and a talent. So then you split again, what you called in your original question, passively. But it's not passively. You have actively grouped up for a chance at the 5 versus 4, but because they're 5 as well, you split again. So it is much more dynamic than your original question asked. I challenge you to look at your replays and to see, to cross-reference it with some of the things I said and to see whether you specifically made the right decision as you cannot influence your teammates overly much. So you know your team's cumulative power spike? Yes, I mean, I've played every hero, I've played a lot of games, so I understand our power spikes fairly well, and I can still be wrong at times. But, yeah, the more you know, the more you factor in a lot of data in a situation. So if you actually look at our replay here on Dragonshire... You made me realize my initial question is actually really dumb. No, 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 it's not dumb. It was wonderful, Heroes. because... You start with combat. a true aspect of the game. Numbers of, of minion waves versus numbers of XP of heroes. And you build on that. It's not dumb. It's the most important stepping stone to build additional logical reasoning on to create your overall uh, decision-making process. But I'm just trying to say it's one part of the whole, not dumb. Battle commencing in ten Teams, seconds. comp, map, multiple win condition, different time. You're saying play the advantage, correct? Right. Five. One. Yeah, I'm not going to play anymore, Jake. I just want to help the brother out a little bit more. So I'm going to just mute the sound here so we can focus, right? So let's let's skip past the mid and go to this point of the game. Okay, 
Red team cleared the minion wave a little faster. That means we have vision control and we can go bot quicker. Uther and Diva are roughly in stasis. And we've got the advantage here. So when this happens, the red team clears minion wave quicker and rotates. Usually the tank will disrupt these four from coming down, forcing them to miss XP or take the long way around. And when they're starting to go long way around, we will always travel more quickly, which allows us to get the next minion wave quickly. What it is it good for if we then spend time standing still waiting for the next wave? Nothing. But it is good if we use that time to get a siege camp. So let's see how we do in that. I, as Vala, aggressively start attacking them, confident that I can dodge Arthas's root and Chromie's damage. And Anubarak does the same thing for the most part and tries to slow them down. So they're going to miss this experience. We've won the rotation and forcing them to go the long way around so that we can use the highway while they're on a dirt road. So now we're going to bully Arthas some more and then we're going to clear the wave quickly and then next we should clear bottom lane quickly again and then we'll get a chance to take the siege camp. So every second we spend here doing nothing would be wasted. So Mephisto, a little bit inefficient movement, but overall fine. Now we get another kill chance on Tychus, but we don't overly chase because then we lose our rotational advantage. So now we're going to clear this lane as quickly as possible again. They actually end up going for Siege Camp earlier, while we get the laser. That's not as valuable. And this is junk time, right? I am here wasting my time. Chromie is soaking and I'm not getting much done except a bit of siege damage, which I do think is valuable, but doesn't immediately yield into a change of the game. So overall, game is pretty in stasis and Uther is leaving top. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. Not to be too, too critical on Mirkrit, but there are five minions here worth soaking. And him leaving now is like... Like, we don't have a shot caller, right? But if we had a shot caller, you know what he would say? Uther come mid, we search for a kill. And that's despite the Dragonite going for our walls. Now, Uther is near Anubarak. They cannot get a kill together. Whereas our DPS are here, and we just got a kill on Chromie. So Uther's coming here is an expected value negative. It can never yield results, his coming now. So... Mirkrit, I had a small conversation with him. He said, I think I should come because Uther offers a lot together with Malf in the, f in the full team for teamfight. That would only be true if Vala is here, Mephisto is here, and the Dragonite is here, and then there's like a, a Tychus here. Then we could try to kill Tychus. But his coming here now only loses minions. So he realized that, and he actually soaks all of the minions, which is fine. He did lose a wall. So he starts one on one again. And he returned here. So he recognized that if he comes here and there's immediately a kill chance on someone here, that would be fine. And this is the key that I'm trying to teach you. There's a timed life. He said the timed life is five seconds. Nothing found? Go back. Okay, Triple M has a question. Okay, this is going to sound super weird. Do you internally ask yourself, how am I progressing this team's win condition while playing? Similar to when you play Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone and ask whether you have lethal. Am I in the right lane? Am I contributing? No, that's mostly subconscious for me. Um, obviously, I try to articulate a lot more of what I'm doing because I'm a streamer and teams that play professionally together will also uh, discuss that inside the game, before the game, after the game and so on. Um, and sometimes you articulate it to your teammates in chat, in, in text. But it's, I think a lot of the hardcore analysis should be done outside of the game so that you can focus on training your autopilot. So you, out of the game, you feed your autopilot useful information, like what you and I are doing now. Then you try to internalize that after you train your autopilot, and then it's time to start training your muscle memory to actually act on that information. Because you cannot be intellectually galaxy brain while also controlling your character, especially if you're not like epic super ultra pro gamer where all your mechanics are 100% perfect without thinking about it. So now, look at this. Uther comes here and he goes bot. He is shown by the minion wave. So the correct thing for blue would be for them to be careful, for the DK to get a bit more value. Now, if Uther gets a kill in the next... 10 seconds, that would be fine, right? This lane is frozen in the middle. Diva will need 10, 10 seconds to reach it and then 6 seconds to clear it. 
And then the pain starts. Uther can fight here for maybe four seconds. And then he starts losing out big time. Now, in four, if he leaves in four seconds, he will have a net balanced effect on top lane. But if he, if he leaves here in 14 seconds, he will have lost 10 seconds, which means it's only worth it if he gets a kill. If he gets a kill in 14 seconds, it's worth it. But if he gets a kill in 24 seconds, it's not worth it. And if he doesn't get a kill, then he must leave in four. Let's see what he does. He gets kicked in the gate. Diva arrived within those 10 seconds. He's stuck. He tries to engage on Brightwing, but Arthas is here. As I said, Diva starts working away. This is now extremely disadvantageous, which means Uther's presence here is only justified if he gets a kill. Now, the good thing is we cleared mid, they didn't. So one lane advantage one lane disadvantage and one player versus zero player disadvantage we are five versus four but we are in bad position and he got kicked into the gate he's also out of position and low we just finished the dread uh the d the d death the dragonite so he gets comboed by chromie and now you've it's the worst of all right he loses top lane and he died so why are we fighting we must because we are not here and it takes us 15 plus seconds to get here. He already initiated. We kind of have position on Arthas, but he's not so squishy. We must fight now. Like he condemned us into a full team fight. Though he may not have thought about it like that. So here we are fighting. And if we get a kill, it may be partially justified. So uh, yeah, all of us are low. I immediately start to try and do something else. But we're losing two towers for nothing. Because if he stayed, everything would have been fine. So now we need someone to clear this. We need to take a camp. We need to clear this. And we need someone here. So Uther comes back here. And he's going to clear this lane. And we can actually take a look at the talents. He, has holy f he doesn't have holy fire. So he clears this whole lane. And now because he cleared the lane and there is no enemy player he's allowed to leave for longer it's at level seven and i say at level seven you can leave for 20 seconds maybe at the most so he left at 4 15 and now he should be back i said 20 seconds and you see that that's true because now his lane has been lost so he should be back now but instead he's here the problem is vala died me i died so he's not really making this a five versus four. He's making it a four versus four. So instead of allowing us, the three, to leave the four to defend from behind the gate, his coming here forces us into a team fight because Vala died. And we lose one and a half minion waves here, which will deal structural damage. We lose one and a half minion waves here with a bruiser camp. So we're going to lose a fort, half a fort, and it, this fight is even. Why are we fighting this? We must, because he came. So we get one Chromie kill, but we lose. We lost the whole fort. Because he came. And I don't think he knows it, and I don't think he knew it when he did it. My death was relatively small in the grand scheme of things, because we were split one, zero, three. And the three recognize three cannot beat four, so three will go two here and one here. And you keep the one here. So you stay in a one, one, two stasis, and that's fine. But every decision you make for rotation influences your allies' EV expected value. So now, because we are nine, they are 10, and they have double laser, here's the problem. They're almost level 10, which means in the next 10 seconds, we are one dead. That means we cannot team fight. We could not team fight even if we're 5v5, but we're not. We have little vision and they have, uh, they are together and we're split, right? The correct play now is to accept losing the Dragonite and to deal with this siege, which is a secondary threat and to deal with this wave, friend. which means Mephisto must mount up and go bot, kill the siege. That means Vala will rotate mid to prepare for the Dragonite and whatever wave. 
and that means Uther should do one wave top and then fall back so that he doesn't get cut off by the Dragonite or Arthas. That's the play. That's the only correct play here. But Uther walks forward. I go with him. They get the DK. Now he must immediately turn around. There's no victory against this. It looks like Brightwing overextend a bit, so I attack. And Cass is just supporting here. But this is not good for us, because we are zoned out from rotating in a relevant manner on the Dragonite. Mephisto did the right thing. He went for the siege camp, but I, Uther, and Malf did not. If Uther had left here and do the top lane like I feel he should, because he is the solo laner, that would have given me the freedom to go around the bush. We are wordlessly doing the wrong thing together, because I feel he's more wrong for staying, therefore I must stay. Because if we're not getting value here, then the only way we can get value is by overgrouping and doing the illogical thing. So he thinks I'm pushing him here because I'm so close to him. So he thinks if I'm here, he should be here. But I think you're the solo laner, I'm not. So if you're not going, then I must stay. So this is wordless communication and you influence each other in every way. What is Cassandra thinking? She thinks I'm not a solo laner. I can't do top lane. If you and you are here, I must come here. And what is Anubarak thinking? Where the fuck is my team? Why are you guys here? What are you doing? But I feel like it's Uther's fault. Because we must fight if he's not laning. So Anubarak is like, alright, I guess we're letting the Dragonite go. I'm just gonna join you guys to see if I can keep you fools alive. And it kind of worked out okay. We didn't lose anybody immediately, but Uther overcommit. We're not at level 10 yet. Meanwhile, I killed D.Va together with Anubarak and we get away, so that's nice. And Mephisto down for some value soak so we can get level 10. Good. Now, Uther is back. We have our ults available. And then, we see them on our siege. But I started Bruiser. So they think we should fight for this. And I feel actually Anubarak is kind of right. Because... If they take our Siege and we take our Bruiser, that's not a good trade. We are level 10, equal talents. They just disengaged. And it's close to us, which means we have fountains to tap from. So I feel like it'd be best if I and everyone else had followed up on Anubarak. He gets to use his Cocoon. But he found that we did not follow him. The Siege was lost. Mephisto can't do it without us. We end up finishing the rest of the Bruiser camp. Now, what is best to do next? Uther's top, which is good. We lost Mephisto, who solo defended, which is bad. Now we don't have much choices. We're never going to commit with Mephisto dead. So we just play it safely and defend. Uther's still top, which is good. Now, Uther cleared a wave and he has a bruiser and one and a half minions. We have options now. We either mass push together with this or Uther is allowed to leave. Now, now it's level 12. At level 12, Uther is allowed to leave for 30 seconds. And we have a situation where the enemy team may have a talent lead, but we could be five versus four. So if Uther joins now, we need to make something happen together very quickly. He's going to ignore Brightwing because he cannot solo kill her. We are now five. We must now push whatever happens. And we know where they are. Diva isn't here. We are 5v4. They are here. So... Uh, what should happen is that Brightwing gets cocooned maybe here and we jump on Chromie, in my opinion. He jumps on Brightwing, misses it, which forces Mephisto to follow up. We go in, he uses Impale and loses it. Diva still didn't come, so I don't care that they have a talent lead. So now Uther again overcommit by himself. You see the gun is orange, so he's going to get miniguns, which means he's dead. There's also the laser. We actually forced him to use laser, and he walked into the final timer of it, which is bad. The three of us are playing more safely. Why? Because we know they can't go anywhere. They're stuck, and Diva is still here, so we don't need to go quickly. We're waiting for the laser to finish, so he overcommits. He missed engage on Brightwing and Impale. That means he has no stuns yet. Eight seconds cooldown four, so the, the rest of us know we must wait. So he goes in, he de-storms, we try to kill Tychus and we get him, it's a one for one, he cocoons Chromie, I wish he would have cocooned Arthas instead so we can kill Chromie, which is better. So Arthas uses all, Anurak goes for Brightwing, 
Malf tries to Twilight Dream, but a great polymorph to interrupt. And then we nearly get those, but we don't. And we finally get Arthas, do we? Yeah, so we get Arthas. So this is a perfect example of we are down a talent, but we go two for one, but we also lose out. But overall, I think it was fairly fine and fairly balanced. But look, minion wave here. So after you get a kill, after every single kill, you need to make a quick judgment call. Do we go for another kill? Or is the map sucking for us right now? And the map sucks. So you use a kill for more kills or you use a kill for freedom on the map. And in this case, we should use it for freedom on the map. Low mana, low health, horrible mid, horrible bot, horrible top. So you split and every second wasted is one that devalues the kills that you just got. Anubara clears this, clears this, I clear this, Uther clears this. Perfect play by us. It's still a bit of a comeback compared to before. We now have equal talents. So that Uther rotation was the best so far. Now he takes top, which is good. Now he should push out two waves. He's alone here, which means we can make use of that. At the same time, we get a kill on D.Va almost, but not quite. And sadly, Anubarak died. So that's our mistake. We fought 4v5. Um, and Uther doesn't get the freedom to push. But now that it happened, it is once again correct for Uther to push out two top waves. And the rest of us can then defend the siege camp. If he joins us now in a 4v5... We are once again forced to teamfight, which we don't want to do. Now Mephisto is dead. So at this point, it's not even safe for Uther to do this anymore. So I get it. At this point, we just have to completely go back and defend. So that's all I'm going to say about this game. I hope it was a good, useful, real-life example for some of the things I tried to teach you there. Uh, no prop, triple M. Will kind of suck if you just wanted to ask a question uh, and then leave in 10 minutes and I just took up 40 minutes of your time. Triple M. <laughs> uh, you said, this is great. One thing I'm wondering is how much are you evaluating macro play like a spectator would or someone who reviews the replay versus micro and how many times you can pull yourself up from playing your hero from playing the game? Mm, well, no one can actually know for 100% sure the exact success chance of a certain move or, or fight. You can only use your experience so let's say we start a fight and i think it's a 55 percent win chance fight we lose and then someone on my team is like we have no damage or that was a stupid rotation then i think we lost that fight and i don't know where it went wrong but someone underperformed so we lost by micro it was the right call but we lost by micro but then uh you just have to accept that like in the long run you win more games where you do the right thing but you might be wrong without knowing it. Maybe that's actually a 30% win chance fight. And you just didn't know it. You overestimated. Well, no one can know for sure. You just try to do the best you can. I have, I've sometimes called a coral in. And someone is like, well, that was stupid. And I'll be like, I don't think so. The map was looking 10% in our favor, 90% in theirs. We have been taking it all game. They took every single boss, every objective. We have one keep versus six keeps. And we took a team fight where we had 20% chance. But we're going to lose 100% sure if we play passively. I'll take that 20% win chance team fight. And uh, what's more, I actually think that we nearly won it, but I missed my scatter. So good job to us for nearly winning it. If we had won it, we would have 30% chance to win the game, which is much better than 0%. That's my view of the game, but someone else might be like, we can't win that fight very well, so we shouldn't take it. Well, then you're just going to lose passively. So you try to make calls and re take responsibility for them, but at the same time, it's also up to people to play it out and do the execution right. I guess I was more asking whether micro is more reflex for you and macro is more what makes you spend your active thinking. Yes, that's true. Macro is a kind of slow, conscious decision-making process. Whereas micro is your uh, robot at work that you don't think much about. That's true. We'll be back tomorrow with more CCL. Maybe Warcraft, maybe HOTS. We'll see. Hope you enjoyed today's stream. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Peace.